Thank you, and it's a, a delight for me to spend some time with you this morning. I hope you enjoy my opening address, which I hope will set the scene for the day as you get a series of speakers talking about this really important topic. I've been asked to talk about taking policy into practice and what really matters in learning. And so I'm going to talk about that from the point of view of the teacher in the classroom and the policymaker working for central government or the policymaker who is the head teacher in the school. I'm going to go quite quickly, but I'm going to make some points that I hope will really feed into the other contributions today. And now and again, I'll stop just for a minute and give you a chance to perhaps talk with someone you're sitting next to about what's been said and how that fits into the thinking that you've got based in the school that you work or in the job that you do for the education system. When we talk about what really matters in learning, the answer is relatively simple. It's these children. The children that we work with day in, day out, and the children that we try to help and support as we teach them the best we can. I work in schools a lot, and when I work with people who work at the primary age, I ask them what they do, and they usually say, I teach primary three, or I teach primary one, or primary six. They talk about the horizontal layers of children's learning, and they talk about their responsibility for a child and a group of children in that, that year-long piece of work. It's not very long before the children leave primary school and go into secondary. We're leaping ahead a bit. Not very long before the children go into secondary school. And when you talk to secondary teachers and say, what do you do? They answer in a different way. They usually say, I teach mathematics, or I teach art, or I teach languages, or I teach history. So they sort of talk about the vertical strands of teaching. And so you've got the primary teachers teaching the horizontal strands and the secondary teachers teaching the vertical strands. What matters and what is really important is that all those teachers who are on the pathway to learning for the children work on the same set of values, the same set of principles, and the same set of understandings so that the children get a coherent, clear pathway to their learning. Because wherever we teach in the system, we have to trust the people before and after. So if I teach primary three, I have to think that primary two and primary four are going to work in the same way that I have to give the children a coherent, continuous experience. If I teach mathematics or PE or art or history or ICT, I have to think the other teachers in my secondary school are offering the same sort of experience for children. So what matters is the pathway and the coherence of it. Because in the end, wherever we teach, we're trying to help youngsters leave school when they come to the end of the pathway as young adults ready to take on the world ready to offer something to the world and ready to cope for themselves as grown-ups in a complex living environment. So the challenge of taking the children along the pathway is really important. And if you're a teacher who works with children who are only this high, it's hard to think that what we're really doing in the next hour or the next day in our school is trying to prepare children for a life as an adult. It's easy to think, I've just got to manage the next hour, I've just got to manage the next day, but we've got to look further than that. If we are, aim, if we are aiming to help our children to make progress into adult life, then surely we need hopes for our young. And I'm going to build a list on here of the hopes that I think most developed countries have generated for the children in their care. We all have hopes for young children. This month, in Thailand, about 40,000 children will be born. That means that they, in 20 years' time, will be young adults. What do we hope for them as they grow up and, and go through the education system? Well, I think that I'm, go I'm going to offer you a list and then stop to let you think about it and see whether you agree with it. But I think across the world, most developed nations, most developed countries would have the view that, first of all, we want 
young people, we would hope that young people have a set of uh, things about themselves that are really important. So first of all, we would want them to be competent and confident. We would want them to be able to manage languages, to be able to manage mathematics in their everyday life, to be able to read, to be able to write, to be able to talk easily, so that they're competent people. And with that competence comes confidence. We would want, surely, youngsters to be able to walk through a doorway and be able to think that they could manage with whatever they met on the other side, so that we give our children the confidence to cope in everyday situations, or whatever they're going to do in life. Next, we would want them to act with integrity, that they would be the sort of person who cares about themselves, is decent to other people, decent to their community, and decent to the globe on which they live, and that they have that spirit in themselves to reflect and think about the actions they take. And then, we would surely want them to be able to be responsible for people and nurture people and help them to make the sort of progress they can, whether it be in work or in the family in which they grow up and the, and the jobs that they take. Next would come a set of hopes about the subjects that ch children would learn about. I think we would want children to be fascinated by the world in which they live, fascinated by the natural world, and then intrigued by the way people, over time, have tried to change that world and adapt it and make it work for them. And after that, I think, we want them to understand how human beings have made some incredible discoveries and some incredible adventure, uh, inventions, but at the same time have found failings. They've made mistakes. So when they've made a brilliant invention, sometimes there's a side effect that we didn't anticipate. Sometimes we've had terrible wars and terrible things happen. And then we have transient peace and we work together to try and make this world a better place. I think we would also hope that children develop all sorts of aspects of their lives, including a uh, the, the sporting, the creative, the cultural, and the innovative work that they might do, so that they enjoy themselves as people and contribute to the world around them. And then we would want them to be respectful, respectful to their family, to their community and to their nation, so that they thought that Thailand was a, a community that cared for them and that they could care for the community as well. We'd want them to appreciate that everybody in this world is not the same, so there are different cultures, different sensitivities, and different orientations, and that we take people as they are and work with them to make the world a better place. And then lastly, two hopes that are really about them, that first of all, they're qualified to take on the next steps in their education, even when they're little children, they're ready for the next step, and when they leave school, they're ready to keep going into whatever field they want to go into. But most importantly, that as they leave school, they're fueled with a desire to learn, the wish to keep learning. I was a head teacher, and we only had three aims in our school, but one of the aims was that every child who leaves this school wants to continue to be a learner and keep stri striving to learn throughout their life. And what a lovely world it is. If we want children to exist and enjoy the world, then just look at the beauty in nature. Look at the glorious things that are around for children to enjoy. The absolutely fantastic world that they inhabit. I've never met a child yet who isn't fascinated by the beauty of a tiger and the, the amazing strength and power that that delicate animal carries with it. And nature brings such incredible challenges. This is that... Um, that volcano that a few years ago erupted in Iceland and brought the northern hemisphere to a halt because aeroplanes couldn't travel anywhere for risk of um, having difficulties with the ash cloud. Why is it that nature can never be tamed? Whatever we do, nature fights back. In Thailand, you struggle at times with some of the, the perils of nature, rocking the earth and doing things to the landscape. Why does nature get angry? It's true, you know, you can never beat nature. Humans always try to beat nature, but it always fights back. So how do we give children the fascination with the world in which we live? 
This is one of the human's great achievements. This incredible thing was built in space. Some astronauts about 25 years ago went up in a space shuttle carrying with them three pieces of metal, screwed them together, came back, and a month later three more astronauts went up with more metal, and our first amazing thing was that they found it. And when they'd found it, they screwed it together and created this incredible space station. And this space station orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, and children can go and stand outside their school and watch it go across and wonder at the achievements of humankind. And education should be about exploring and understanding. In Thailand, you've signed up to purple schooling, the recognition that all children are not the same and do not have the same orientations, and maybe they have different sensitivities. And how do we help our children to understand the world if we can't talk about them as people and what they want? And just to finish this bit, this is one of the iconic photos so far of the 21st century. This is the photograph of a Mexican miner that appeared at the end of an optic fiber as it was dropped down into the mine that had collapsed 15 days before. This person's face appeared, and from there on, there was a race against time to, to get the miners out of the mine safely. And on the 31st day, 31 people escaped from the mine, one of the greatest ever rescues. And in those 31 days, their families kept vigil. They lit fire, they kept light, and they hoped against hope that their fellows would return. And children need to understand what it is in the human spirit that helps us to believe even when all hope seems to be gone. Now, I don't know what you think about my hopes, but it's such a lovely world that we want children to learn about it. In school, we ask them to read. We teach them to read, and books open the doors to the world in which we live. They teach us about people, they teach us about places, they teach us about bygone times, and they teach us about what the future might hold. The big problem in schools is we also ask children to do this, that they have to write about so much of what they do. And the pencil comes out as soon as we, we know they're able to write. I always think if I, if I was a little child and I was getting to about this height, and if I knew then what I knew now, and I was realizing I could be a writer and I knew how to write, I think I'd pretend I couldn't. Because the minute they find out you can write, they make you do it all the time. There's hardly an hour goes by without somebody makes you write something down, just to prove that they're still there. So I think that writing is one of the things that actually can, if we're not careful, create problems. I'm a bit unkind because we do some brilliant things in school, some massively exciting experiments, and then we have to write about them. And the writing is something I think we really have to think about as we go along. So that's my list of hopes, and I don't know whether you agree with it, but I would contend that across the globe an enormous amount of people would agree with that. They might want to argue with the words, and they might want to say, let's say it in another way, but they're a set of hopes that most would see as purposeful. I've colored some red now, because those are the ones that appear in the subjects of English and mathematics, the competence, and then the other ones are the geography, the history, and the science. What then happens is the green ones come into most people's national curriculums as art, as PE, as design and technology, as, as uh, ICT, computer studies. And so what happens is that the curriculum that children get in schools tries to meet the hopes. The ones that are now left blue are the ones that nearly every national curriculum in the world mentions, but when you go into schools, there's little definition about what children should do about them, and we sort of hope schools do it, and we believe they will if they've got time, but we leave it to look rather than planning, rather than policy. Now, I'm going to carry on from here in a few minutes, but I thought you might just like one minute to talk to each other about what I've said so far. So I'm going to stop talking and invite you to talk to each other, not in a great crowd, just lean to somebody next to you and say, I agree with him, or I don't know what he's talking about, or he's a nice man, but um, one, one time he'll get on. But just one minute to talk, off you go. I'll tell you when we finish, so talk away. 
and I'll have a drink. Okay, even the technicians are worried. They think I, I've broken down or something. I just believe that now, again, now and again we should stop and talk and think, and so I do it in talks. If they're, if they're the hopes for the young that we might take forward, then the next thing we might talk about is the big challenge that many schools seem to face. I've read a lot about Thailand's education system and I've read a lot of official papers. And countries all over the world mirror the problem you've got in Thailand, which is how do we get good subject results but also produce young people who display some of the characteristics that we would hope they would develop. Do we want children who are passive, dependent, play safe or anxious and care about failure? Or do we want children who are inquisitive, determined, imaginative, thoughtful, discerning and collaborative? Now most people would say they would want the last one, the lower one on that list. And it's interesting to see that you write this in your Thailand documents about what we expect for our children. The problem is that often we can't let go of the subject teaching in order to make the other parts of our teaching work. Now I'm going to show you a little analogy of teaching and you might like to think about this. But what happens is that teachers do affect the heart and the mind of children. If you're a teacher who just simply wants children to transcribe, be correct, memorize, complete things, you end up with children who are incredibly dependent on the teacher. Better than that, surely, is to have children who discuss, who imagine, can join in and wonder, who think about things and criticize what they're seeing. And even better than that, is to get youngsters engaged in experiments, solving problems, explaining why things are happening, and applying their learning in subjects to something practical and engaging. In a lot of the uh, material I've read on Thailand's system, you talk about getting the children involved in activity. Well, the activities will lead to the sorts of learning that we think are part of the hopes for our young. The challenge is how we get our teachers to extend the repertoire of skills that they've got. Many teachers believe that they can only teach in the way they've always taught and feel inhibited in moving forward and trying to, walk, to broaden the range. Here's an analogy that I use with a lot of teachers in the UK and around the world. If we see all learning as a tree, and we thought that when children are very little, they're sort of at the bottom of the trunk. And when children are very, very small, they might splash in a puddle. And they might see their reflection in a puddle. And what they do, we don't go up to them and say, we're doing science. We're looking at reflections. It's science. We say they're playing in a puddle and enjoying the world. Little children see the world. They don't see subjects at all. As they get up to the top of the primary school age, and start moving into secondary, then they become aware that the world, the world sort of branches out. And there's a branch over there called science, and there's one over there called mathematics, and there's one over there called art, and there's one up there called history. And each of those branches takes us into areas of human knowledge. And the branches have been developed over time so that historians work in a different way from the way in which mathematicians work. And mathematicians work in a different way from artists, and artists in a different way from scientists. They've all got different disciplines, and that's why we call them subject disciplines. And we're helping children to find their way along those branches. As the branches go further on, they divide again. So science becomes physics and chemistry and biology. And a little bit later on, they divide again, and biology becomes botany and zoology. And a little bit further on, they divide into little tiny twigs called microbiology, astrophysics. And here and there, history overlaps with science. So you get geological work under the sea, marine geology. And you might get marine archaeology, where history and science overlap. So what we're trying to show children is that the branches of knowledge 
some of which I've listed here, actually help us to discipline ourselves. But when you stand back from the tree, it's just one big canopy of learning that's worth getting engaged in. The branches are the way in which humans have tried to uncover the world and make sense of it. And the trunk is the experience that children have of learning. The leaves themselves are the lessons. So when we're teaching a lesson in mathematics on trigonometry, it is but a leaf on the branch of mathematics. When we're teaching a lesson about Narong Jampoom, the puppeteer from Thailand, it's but a leaf on the branch of art. When we're talking about coastal erosion, and we refer to what's happening in Thailand, it's a piece of geography on a great big branch of study. Now, if we can see that we spend our time organizing the leaves and we study subjects in this way, we also might think about the roots. Because the point of all this teaching and teaching about the leaves along the branches is to develop children who are confident as individuals, responsible as citizens as they grow up, and competent as learners in their own right. And the better we feed the, brown, uh, feed the roots, the better the branches will grow. And of course, if we get the tree growing properly, then there'll be a strong root system that helps children to become those sorts of characteristics that we want to see. So thinking skills, developing inquiry skills, learning things like essential literacy and numeracy, the social skills they need to get on together can come through the subjects. It's not subjects or people, it's actually people through subjects and subjects through people. So the whole thing works in harmony and develops in a really nice way. Now I don't know what you think about the tree analogy, but it helps us to then get into thinking about the sorts of learning children do in school. On the screen now you can see a few hexagons and they, they've just got in them the sorts of words people use to describe the way in which they want our children to learn so they achieve the hopes that I mentioned previously. Typically schools say we do academic work and then we also do some practical work. We try and teach our children socially and culturally and spiritually. We try to do some sport and there would be many, many more hexagons to explore. What happens though in school is that sometimes we lose track of what's really important. One of the biggest challenges is the PISA tests. Some of you will know what they are and some of you won't and I haven't got time to explain it now except to say they're tests that are carried out across the globe on a sample of children and each nation taking part. And every three years PISA produced the next set of results and nearly everywhere in the, in the world has some results that go down. So the media everywhere in the world says things are getting worse in our, in our country. These are just some of the headlines. So in Spain this, this last time they were really worried about it. In Malaysia in 2012 there were concerns about maths was going down. And then you've got Australian teenagers are getting worse than they ever have. New Zealand went down, the UK went down, even Finland went down. And it's a wonderful system to create a problem because every time they do the test, most of the nations go down in something. And therefore, you get this energy to go better in PISA. Governments say we must get better, we must improve our results against all of the nations. And consequently, there's a great rush in schools to try and help to do that. In fact, it's only a very small sample, and whether you could make a difference or not is hard to determine. But the PISA results are one of the biggest dampeners on improving schools right across the globe. The, school, the, the, the countries that are doing well near the top of the, of the PISA tables will never criticise it, because why would they? Those at the bottom... If they criticise it, they sound, sound as though they're crying. So they daren't criticise. And it gets away with it every three years. But what it leads to is children all over the world jumping through hoops. They jump through hoops that are particularly around maths and English because the results in those subjects 
because become so vitally important. And that means we end up with academic being the headline that children have to work towards. And the academic is really interesting because that suddenly becomes pen and paper learning. And if there's one thing that children across the globe would cry out for, it's less pen and paper learning. And in, in Thailand, I've read so many documents that say the children are inhibited by the amount of pen and paper. There are those writers again. Everywhere you look, they're having to write. And Thailand, like children across the room, uh, across the world, has children who are motivated, stimulated, engaged, raring to go in learning. And sadly, across the world and in Thailand, there are children who are mystified by what they're doing, bored, disengaged, or just compliant. And they're not achieving those hopes that we were aiming for in those early slides. So what we need is some sort of system where children, instead of jumping through hoops, can follow the trail that the hoop is taking them. We're never quite sure where learning will take us. We follow it as far as we can. We take our own route, and our teachers can take us on their own route as well. So going forward in policy, I put this together in terms of Thailand because of what I've read. It seems that we have a philosophy. We have a national curriculum, and we have a real ambition for all the pupils in our schools. And that's the policy bit. What then has to happen to make the policy work is at least three lines of work have to take place. First of all, teachers have to believe that they are the people who make the policy. And so consequently, they've got to do things like this. They've got to have the confidence to step away from textbook-driven learning. They've got to move towards making sense of learning for children so that they do more how and why. So the children are saying, how does that happen? Why does that work? And then investigate it to go forward. And they need to take more notice of pupil voice. And if they did the things on that list, the notice of pupil voice would rise and grow. The pupil voice thing is writ large in your national curriculum and your ambition for children. So it has to become a real thing for you. Similarly, teacher training, whether it's for early teachers or teachers throughout their career, needs to embrace the philosophy, the curriculum, and the ambition by doing, by, by doing more about the hopes and the beliefs and purposes and more about engaging and motivating children and less on simply transmitting knowledge about the subject. And that means there would be more purposeful classrooms upon which we could build for the future. And lastly, the policy makers at district and school leadership level have to really take it seriously in the sense of promoting the improvement ethos with the big wide community, not just in their school, and building ongoing systemic change so that they become accountable for the learning culture in schools which means using data and evidence in a wise way so that it's shared and used effectively. And I think the three things on there in green are absolutely the heart of making schools as good as they can be in Thailand. One of our problems is that in education across the globe, there is a sort of idea that if we want to achieve something, we can do it by formula. And many, many countries now are sort of pushing their schools into a formulaic approach. If I wanted to throw that ball into that hoop, I know that I would have to apply certain force compared to its mass and throw it at a certain velocity, at a certain trajectory, and it would hit its destination. And what's happening across the globe is that we're seeing children as people upon which we, we construct a formula in order that they will leave, so learn. So if we do this at the right time, on the right day, for the right length, with the right children, we will achieve. What we forget in that is children are not like a ball. A ball is inanimate, whereas children have a volition. They have a life of their own. So when we throw a child forward, or a bird, the bird takes flight, and we would want children to take flight so that they belong, and they believe, 
and they develop a disposition to learning which gives them a feeling of destiny. And one of the big challenges for teachers is to give children a feeling of the destiny that they can take forward so that instead of those words that were there before, we start to achieve the hopes that we have for them. That children become ethical people, children who are innovative, respectful, courageous, industrious, children who are able to sustain themselves and compassionate people who can communicate well. And they're different words from those simple words that were there before. They fulfill the hopes we have for the children that we trust. If we did that, then children would do technology and they would do sport and they would see the way in, the way in which technology has influenced sport. And then they would start to realize the way technology through sport has made a difference to people with disability these last few years. They would see people working and realize the way technology is influencing the environment and maybe want to be part of that in their work in life. Not all children can be famous like Malala, but all children can make a difference to their environment if we help them to fulfill the hopes we have for them. They need to understand that people across the globe live in different circumstances. Some people are rich and some people have relatively few resources. They need to understand the United Nations Articles of Childhood. They need to understand that all children have rights and all children should be allowed to exploit themselves, not be exploited. So that as they grow up and they become the sorts of people we want them to be, we support them and help them in achieving our hopes. Most, most children will eventually become parents. We would want them to become great parents. That's surely one of the most fundamental things. So moving on, I'll just run to the finish by showing some pictures of children at work. If you give a very, very young child any equipment, they will try to use it. They may not use it how you want them to use it, but they will always use equipment. Young children need to play. Young children need to explore and exploit. This child is testing the hardness of wood, not simply hammering. These children are exploring and wondering and experimenting with a circuit at the age of three. Children will be inventive, develop new ideas. Children will observe, understand the world by watching carefully. They'll create. This is Jackson Pollock for three-year-olds. Look at this, this child creating patterns on the floor. And these lovely little children come clean when you wash them. They need to be outdoors, creating problems and solving problems, working with technology and open space, caring for creatures and looking after plants, using flowers and realizing that they're strong and flowers are fragile, getting involved in real art, building things bigger than them, going to museums, to galleries, understanding the world beyond the, de the school, and then recording it and making sense of it, and writing because they need to, writing because they have a proper audience, writing because they've got something to say, writing because there's a purpose, writing like people do in the real world, so that they can use their writing for proper purposes, being supported if they've got special needs, and producing high quality work because they've been taught how to do it and because it matters. Well, all children need to be able to play their own tune and make the world come alive for them. Now what I've done for you is talk through our hopes for our young and tried then to say how do we take that from policy into practice and give teachers the view that they can take things forward. Our other speakers will pick up on lots of the issues I've raised in more depth and give examples of what's happened across the globe in their different countries. But what, what we need to appreciate is that it's a really big picture coming down to the detail of the classroom that only classroom teachers can make happen.